Hello everyone, we're here at the national headquarters of the Federal Communications Commission in Washington, D.C. Uh, for an exclusive YouTube interview with the chairman of the FCC, Julius Janikowski, who moments ago just announced the National Broadband Plan, which is the FCC's plan to get fast, affordable, high-speed internet to Americans across the country. Uh, my name is Steve Grove, and I'm the head of news and politics at YouTube. And Mr. Chairman, thanks for taking these questions today. Thank you very much. It's great to participate in this. You know, I should say this is part of a series of conversations that we're doing with government leaders uh, across D.C. in which we ask citizens to submit questions on YouTube, vote on their favorites, and then we pose them in a one-on-one in -on -one interview. We did uh, one with President Obama in the White House about a month ago, and then we also posed the top YouTube questions to congressional leaders coming out of the uh, health care summit that happened uh, about two weeks ago in D.C. So uh, today we're going to focus on the Internet in particular. Uh, and, and I think you know, people are excited about this, thousands of people engaged online, but I do think a lot of people, when they hear about the FCC, they think about things like regulating wardrobe malfunctions at the halftime of the Super Bowl or, or keeping swear words off of, of TV or, or the radio. So before we actually dive into the questions, can you just tell us a little bit more about what it is that you do at the FCC? Absolutely. The, the FCC is the agency that oversees our wired and our wireless communications infrastructure. So whether it's mobile telephones, internet through wires, uh, broadcast cable, satellite, mm -hmm. uh, it's all part of what we do. You know, as most of the folks who are watching this know, in this day and age, it's all digital. It's, uh, ones and, it's zeros and ones. It's text, audio, video. Uh, so the FCC has that responsibility and as I'm looking forward to talking about, it's a key infrastructure for the 21st century. Well, let's dive into the, to the internet part of what the FCC does. And, and before we get to the questions, let's just lay the groundwork a little bit in terms of kind of where America is at in terms of uh, broadband statistics. 35% of Americans do not have broadband in their homes. Uh, the U.S. actually ranks 15th in broadband adoption. 14 million rural Americans have no on-ramp to the internet at all, and the U.S. ranks 11th in PC ownership. So people sometimes are surprised to see that the, the U.S. is actually struggling in this area of broadband. And let's let Elizabeth Stark uh, from Brooklyn, New York start us off. She has a question focused on both cost and competition when it comes to the internet. Great. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Stark, and I have a question for Chairman Janikowski about broadband. I have friends elsewhere in the world, for example in France and South Korea, that have access to far greater internet speeds and lower prices than we do here in the U.S. Broadband is becoming increasingly unaffordable to many Americans. For example, Comcast just this week announced a rate hike. Most Americans, including myself, have access to only one or two broadband providers, and recent FCC research has shown that this isn't going to necessarily improve with the advent of more wireless providers. Chairman Jadikowski, what do you plan on doing to increase competition in the broadband space, to increase speeds for Americans to access the internet, and to lower broadband prices? So a lot in there, but let, let's get at that lower prices issue. What can the FCC do to help? Sure, lower it's a, it's essential. Uh, there's very little that's more important to the FCC than promoting competition and the provision of broadband services. Competition is what will get us lower prices, better services, innovation, investment, and so it's a great question. It's a vital issue. And there's no silver bullet. There's a lot that we need to do. We need to remove barriers to competition so that companies that want to offer broadband competition can get into the market and provide broadband services. One of the things we need to do is make sure that consumers are empowered with information they can use to make the market work. So right now, uh, many people, when they see ads about broadband speeds, see up to ads, uh, you know, in the in this world, uh, they're 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 called uh, you know advertised uh, uh, advertised speeds. Mm -hmm. One of the things that the broadband plan proposes is to make sure consumers are armed with information about actual mm -hmm. broadband speeds. Our research shows that actual speeds are often much lower than the advertised speeds, and so by making sure that consumers have that information, we can help them make the market work. One of the things, if I, if I could just say one other thing about this, one of the things we've done as part of a multi-part strategy is to uh, release applications that consumers can use to measure their own speeds mm -hmm. and see how they're doing, part of an effort to put competitive pressure on broadband providers to bring up speeds and bring down prices. So the idea is that if you know how fast the broadband is and you're not happy with it, that will pressure 
the companies who do control the internet access and, and farm it out there uh, to think more competitively about pricing? Is, is, that, is that what you're doing? Well, that's, that's part of it. Listen, consumers need to make the market work. We need to empower consumers with information to make the market work. And we need to make sure that we remove barriers to all potential competitors, wired and wireless, so that we have vibrant, robust, healthy competition in broadband. That's how uh, uh, you know, we're going to tackle the competition issues. It's a great question. And it's a key part of the strategy to bring rates down and services up. I think some of the frustration we saw from questions that came in is some people are, are trying to figure out, is internet a right? Is it a privilege? Let's go to, to Michael Tapp, who's a digital video producer and who asks, let's go to Michael here. About let's go ahead issue. and assume that the fiber has already been laid. How does the FCC look at broadband from a regulatory point of view? Does the FCC look at broadband as a commercial service or critical infrastructure? Well, I think it's both. Uh, uh, it is a commercial service. We need competition. It's absolutely critical infrastructure. It's for our generation what telephones, electricity, uh, um, uh, canals uh, were for prior generations. We have to take it seriously. Just like in the 20th century, the electric grid gave us all sorts of innovations, right? Um, uh, refrigerators, TVs, ultimately computers, all these appliances. In the 21st century, it'll be our information grid that'll give us all of this, right? It's not appliances mm -hmm. now, it's app, it's applications, it's still apps. But this is where uh, the innovation, the jobs of the future is gonna come from. It's the platform on which we'll tackle uh, uh, healthcare, education, energy of the future. It's a critical, it's the most vital infrastructure, I think, for the 21st century. We have to treat it that way so that we have world-class infrastructure everywhere in the United States. So it sounds like your answer is you think it's both a private industry and a critical infrastructure. I mean, w would you say the internet is, is a right for Americans? Is it, a, is it a privilege? Is it somewhere in between? Well, I think the critical thing is that all Americans need to have access to world-class infrastructure. Uh, it's how healthcare in the future will be provided. I mean, not, you know, you're not gonna, well, actually, someday you might have your surgery, uh, re you know, remotely. But um, uh, medical information online, education, you know, kids anywhere should be able to access the best information, the best teachers anywhere. It's what we need to really deliver on smart grid and en energy savings. You know, every consumer needs to have broadband access so that they can know what energy they're using and help put pressure on, uh, you know, in that area to, to move to a clean energy future. And by the way, there, there are a lot of innovations that we can imagine are coming down the road. But the truth is, if we're here in five years and 10 years talking about it, the most important innovations that most benefit Americans will probably be things that we can't imagine now, but that won't exist unless we have world-class broadband infrastructure everywhere in the United States. You know, when we talk about broadband, I feel like there are a lot of big companies we talk about, AT&T, Comcast, Verizon, et cetera. But there are a lot of smaller business owners who also operate in the broadband space. One of them is um, named Brent, uh, Brent Glass from Laramie, Wyoming, and here is his question. My name is Brent Glass, and I'm the owner and founder of Lariat, the world's first wireless ISP, or WISP. WISPs are small local businesses and have the least expensive deployment cost per square mile of any broadband technology. Mr. Chairman, you mentioned that the broadband plan will offer spectrum and subsidies to the big mobile broadband providers. Will the plan help WISPs and hence consumers by helping us to obtain reasonably priced spectrum and internet bandwidth, or will it just give more of an advantage to the big guys? Thank you for being here today and for considering my question. Well, that's a, that's a great question, and we need exactly this kind of entrepreneurship all over the country to think creatively about how to provide broadband, how to compete. This is what it will take. The plan that we're going to put in place, a couple of things. Um, unleashing spectrum is critically important. We have the opportunity to lead the world in mobile. It's really essential. We have some big obstacles to it. Maybe we'll come back and talk about it in terms of whether we're going to have enough spectrum available. Mm -hmm. Just essential. And as we look to roll out uh, broadband infrastructure around the country, we've got to be neutral as between wired and wireless in the sense that uh, if there are entrepreneurs uh, who can offer 
uh, high speeds at low costs in communities around the country using wireless infrastructure. We have to have rules that encourage that. We have to bring down any barriers that impede with it, and we have to encourage competition between everyone involved. Look, some of the big companies out there, uh, 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 including you know YouTube and others, all of them started as small businesses, and we need to encourage small businesses and entrepreneurs. Uh, empower them so they have a chance to become big ones and to have a vibrant, competitive, healthy marketplace. You know, entrepreneurs like Brett are, are literally out there in rural areas of America you know, putting wireless routers up on tops of silos and barns and such to help get wireless internet to folks. Let's talk about the spectrum a little bit. What is the FCC going to do to make sure that there's more wireless internet access available for people uh, through entrepreneurs like Brett? Yeah, well this is a, a, a huge issue, right? Um, uh, your smartphone uses 30 times the bandwidth of your old cell phone. If you take a laptop and plug in an air card, you'll be using 150 times the mm -hmm. bandwidth. If you're providing fixed wireless broadband access, it's 7,000 times the amount of bandwidth. Uh, the problem is, while we have uh, some more spectrum coming online for mobile broadband, it's not even close to the capacity that we resource. expect and that we need. It's a scarce resource. Um, uh, and we need to find ways to free it up for lots of different uses. We need to free it up for, uh, uh, for licensed um, use. We need to free it up for unlicensed use, for things like Wi-Fi, right, right. where the FCC um, uh, you know, a, a, a while ago freed up some spectrum for unlicensed use. It was called a junk band. No one knew what it would be good for. And some innovators and entrepreneurs said, hey, actually the first thing they said was, um, we can make garage openers that use this spectrum. Mm -hmm. But eventually entrepreneurs said, you know what, we can um, uh, develop Wi-Fi on this spectrum. Wi-Fi lives on unlicensed spectrum. We need to find more spectrum to put on the market for both licensed and unlicensed use for both big companies and small companies. And, and you're going to transfer that spectrum from broadcasters to, to cable providers via an, an auction of, of some kind, is that right? Yeah, well we need to look you know, everywhere in our spectrum chart. There are no easy pickings on the spectrum chart. It would be nice if there was some place we could go. Um, so we're looking for ways to kind of scour the spectrum for uses that aren't uh, uh, as efficient as they could be, find ways to repack existing uses, to, to incentivize uh, existing users to free up spectrum. Mm -hmm. uh, we can get that spectrum back. We can auction off some of it, raise revenue for the public. We can put other spectrum out for unlicensed use. But the important thing is we have the chance to lead the world in mobile. We have, you know, we have the best innovators and entrepreneurs around mobile in the world, but if we don't take the barriers like sufficient spectrum seriously, we'll lose out on the chance to lead the world. Mr. Chairman, we want to get to as many questions as sure. we can, and so we're going to do sort of a quick lightning round. We're going to call <laughs> F.C. Caesar. Uh, your name is Julius. Uh, you're a decision maker in the government. Uh, we're going to give you some quick yes or no questions. Give a thumbs up if you think yes, a thumbs down if you think no, and you get like one sentence to describe uh, your decision of, of yes or no. Fair enough. So the first FCC's or question comes from uh, Oakland, California. Will you commit to personally meeting with grassroots groups outside the Beltway in the cities that you travel to, especially before moving ahead on important topics like net neutrality, media ownership, and wireless competition? Yes. You know, we've been doing a lot to open up the FCC uh, beyond lobbyists in Washington to ordinary citizens around the country using FCC.gov and broadband.gov. Uh, doing hearings around the country. We'll do more and more of it. Thumbs up. Thumbs up, okay. The next FCCs are comes from P. Keys in Milipitas, California. Can the internet continue to effectively scale without a technology upgrade? Uh, no, but we have the best innovators, entrepreneurs, technologists in the world. We need to incentivize them with uh, increasingly better broadband infrastructure and opportunities so that they continue to develop the world leading uh, infrastructure that uh, and broadband that we can have in this country and that we need. Great, and one more uh, yes or no question here. Does the FCC believe that every internet line should be of high enough quality to start a business? And if so, will it set a minimum quality rule? Uh, uh, thumbs up, I think. I'm trying to understand the question, but I will say this. One of the reasons that we're pushing so hard on universal broadband, high speeds, low prices, is because of small businesses. Wherever you are in the country, whether you're in a small town or an inner city, you ought to be able to start a small business and you ought to be able to take an existing small business and use the internet to expand it. Let's get back to some video questions. Uh, Navarro Wright and Max Benavidez wanted to know 
what the FCC is going to do to address particular communities who have traditionally had challenges getting online. Uh, there's two video questions here. Mr. Chairman, we know the broadband access is critical for success for individuals, for communities, for our society. What are you going to do to help ensure broadband access for Latinos, the fastest growing group in America? My question is, would your proposed network neutrality rules help or hinder efforts to close the digital divide, increase deployment of broadband to minorities and unserved or underserved communities, and increase broadband adoption by minorities? Thank you for your time. Well, these are, these are great questions. First, um, some, some data. Mm -hmm. uh, overall, broadband adoption in the U.S. is 65 percent. It's too low. It compares to 90 percent uh, for some other countries in Asia and Europe. Uh, so overall, we need to lift that 65 percent higher. But here's the scary thing. In particular communities, the adoption rate is even lower. It's true of low-income communities, rural communities, and minority communities. And this is the land of opportunity. This is a country where everyone needs to have full opportunity. In the 21st century, it won't happen without the Internet. So there's no silver bullet to solve this. The plan takes it very seriously. Uh, we need to take uh, digital literacy seriously, uh, empower people uh, 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 wherever they live with the tools they need to get online. Uh, we're working on partnerships that specifically tackle that first step, getting a computer uh, learning basic skills. Um, we're going to transform our universal service fund. Uh, it's a big annual fund that historically has helped low-income people, minorities over the years to get basic telephone service. Mm -hmm. We've got to transform it so that it applies to broadband as well. And let me respond on the net neutrality point. Yeah. Net neutrality is essential for opportunity in all communities, including minority communities. Uh, if you have an idea for a business or a programming venture, uh, getting on the major traditional communications media landscapes is very difficult. We need to figure out ways to open that up. Uh, but the opportunities of the future are going to be for someone who has uh, an idea for a business or an idea for a programming venture to be able to get online, to reach an audience, uh, 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 and, and, and to build a successful business, whether it's a business or a programming entity. Mm -hmm. And so net neutrality uh, uh, is designed to make sure that everyone, regardless of what community uh, that you're from, regardless of your background, that you have an opportunity to get your ideas, your business, your programming out on the internet, reach an audience, have it stand or fall on its own merit without having to uh, 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 deal with the roadblocks that are making traditional media really hard. We need to tackle those roadblocks, but we definitely need to keep the internet free and open for entrepreneurs and programmers and people with ideas and speakers from every background and community. You know, one of the other communities that we've talked about a little bit here today, but that I'd like to drill down on for a moment is rural America. Mm -hmm. uh, we got this question from Evslin in Vermont who asked, what about most rural towns? We have no broadband and no mobile phone access. Our businesses and children are leaving? Well, this is a great question, right? This country has tackled this kind of question before with electricity and with telephones, and we made a decision as a country that if we want rural America to participate in the new economy, the new economy used to involve electricity and telephones, it involves those things now, but the new economy involves the internet and broadband. We need to find a way to extend broadband everywhere in the country. The, the core initiative there is transformation of this universal service fund that I mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, because that's a critical part of the program to, a critical part of the program that exists to extend communications infrastructure to rural America. And, and is that because uh, broadband companies aren't incentivized to go that far out, it's just too expensive and, and the government needs to help out? Is that, is that why the, the role of the FCC matters here? That's exactly the issue. I mean, the, the economics of broadband, you know, they aren't that complicated. The less dense the population, mm -hmm. the more expensive it is to provide broadband per person. And so the more incentivized companies are to stick to dense population areas. It's understandable, but it's not good enough. And so we need to find ways to remove barriers, to improve the economics, in rural America, as we did with ordinary telephone service, as we did with electricity, we need to apply now the same energy and focus to broadband uh, so that you know, entrepreneurs, small businesses in rural America, kids in rural America, you know, seniors in rural America who have uh, health issues, anyone can have the same opportunities in rural America that they have in big cities. Well, let's talk about kids for a second. We actually got some questions from students. And 
you know, in today's classrooms, the internet is almost as important to success as, say, I don't know, number two pencils were for you and I back when we were, we were in school. Uh, this question came from some second graders, actually, in Menlo Park. Jenna Chowski, we are the Trinity School second graders, and we want to ask a question. We use the internet almost every day, but we know there are other students who can't. What will the FCC do to help kids all over the United States get access to the internet so they can research, play educational computer games, learn more, and make learning fun and easier. Please help kids learn better now. Ah, <laughs> uh, well, that is such a great question. When, when I go around, when I leave Washington and I talk to people around the country, I talk to teachers, and they tell me that one of their biggest issues is that they'll uh, have a class where half of their kids don't have broadband. And they say, what are we supposed to do? If we give homework assignments that rely on the internet for research and writing papers, uh, half our kids uh, can't participate in that. If we don't, we're not serving the kids who do have broadband access. You know, what are we supposed to do? It's a great question. Um, we need to do a few things. One is we have an E-rate program that funds infrastructure at schools around the country. We need to upgrade that so that it really works for schools everywhere. And we need to understand now that the issue is not just getting internet into classrooms. It is that. And a lot of schools complain that their speeds aren't high enough. We have to tackle that. But it's also tackling the adoption issues that we've heard from some mm -hmm. of the other questions mm -hmm. at home. Uh, it's no longer enough to get broadband in schools. We have to get, get kids broadband at home. Parents want to participate. And so the full range of recommendations on deployment and adoption uh, are critical for education. So would the National Broadband Plan free up federal dollars to get the internet in local schools? Well, we have, as I said, the, the, the Universal Service Fund is an existing, uh, it's about $8 billion a year program. Okay. So that money that, would go. Um, that, yeah, it, it's going to good uh, programs now for rural America, for inner city America, for schools and health clinics. It's just focused on 20th century telephone service. And so we have a plan that we announced today to cut and cap the, uh, uh, the traditional program and start shifting that money as fast as we can uh, to broadband so that we're meeting for the internet the same goals that we've met as a country for telephone service. Got it. So if, if I'm a teacher and I don't have internet in my classroom, the FCC might have a, a way for me to get broadband through some of this. Absolutely. Go to, go to broadband.gov. Look up the E-Rate program. Okay. Uh, it's, a, it's a terrific program right now, and we're going to work really hard on making it better for a broadband era. Let's, uh, let's shift back to the issue of net neutrality for a moment, because this was a, a hot topic in this series, as you can imagine. A lot of people on the internet uh, care about this issue. And we actually have two video questions we'd like to play for you, one from an entrepreneur named Deborah Brown in Boulder, and the next from a, a gentleman named Phil Dampier in Rochester, New York. Great. My name is Deborah Brown, and I have a company called Mobilize Us. My question to you today is about net neutrality. The public has spoken, and nearly 2 million Americans have declared their support for strong net neutrality protections. In response, the phone and cable companies have spent millions trying to defeat efforts to protect net neutrality. My question to you is, do you believe that the phone and cable companies currently have more influence over the FCC than the public whose interests you're supposed to be representing. Thank you. And, and let's let Phil uh, weigh in as well here before we hear your answer, Mr. Chairman. Dear Chairman Janachowski, industry lobbyists have claimed that net neutrality will thwart investment needed to connect more communities to high-speed internet services. As far as I can tell, no one has produced a shred of evidence to support this claim. Do you believe we need to sacrifice the Internet's fundamental openness in order to provide connections to people who don't now have broadband? Well, I think these are two folks who we need to hire at the FCC <laughs> and get directly involved in our processes because I agree with what they're saying. One of the things we've been trying very hard to do in general uh, is to open up the FCC so that ordinary citizens, small businesses, entrepreneurs, innovators around the country can participate in our proceedings. Uh, we have a staff here that's committed to doing the right thing for the country, and we do need as much participation as we can, as we can get. On the second question, uh, I agree completely with the thrust of the question. 
keeping the internet free and open is a pro-innovation, pro-economic growth, pro-job creation strategy. That's what we know from the last 20 years of an internet with an open architecture. We need to make sure that as the next generation of the internet and broadband unfolds, that we preserve the freedom and the openness of the internet that has served us so well, that has led to so much incredible innovation and job creation, and that it continues to do that for the next generation of the internet. Another category we had in this uh, moderator series is about mobile and wireless. And, and the top question that came in on mobile was from Kevin in Baltimore, who asked, what is the FCC doing to ensure competition among cell phone providers and to ensure that consumers are allowed to use their devices however they want and with whichever provider they want, so long as it's not detrimental to the network? Right, it's a, an another really good question. You know, competition across all of the different uh, uh, areas that we look at is absolutely essential. We find that in mobile, uh, one of the big obstacles to competition is um, a lack of good information about choices. And so a strategy of uh, employing information technology to make sure that consumers have better information so they can make the market work is a key part of, of what we're doing. You know, on this and on a number of the other issues that have been raised, we have open proceedings at the FCC uh, at FCC.gov, people can participate, they can make their views known. It's extremely helpful as we tackle these issues. We need to have an FCC that's open not just to lawyers and lobbyists in Washington, but to individuals, citizens, small businesses, entrepreneurs, innovators all around the country exactly on these kinds of issues. What do you think about this? Because I think what he's getting at, if I had to guess, is he might have an iPhone or he doesn't want to use AT&T, or he right. might have a Verizon phone or he doesn't want to use Service X. Not to point out particular brands, but I do think a lot of people are frustrated with this issue of not having choice with your mobile provider and your device. Is that something the FCC is, is going to handle here when it comes to wireless internet, or is that not an issue that's part of the, the plan? No, itself? no, that is something that we're looking at. It's, a, it's an issue of you know, exclusivity. And here's, I'll tell you exactly what we're looking at. Um, there's a real debate about whether um, uh, the uh, exclusive contracts that most people get when they get mobile phones on balance mm -hmm. uh, promote innovation or hinder innovation. Right. We need a lot of input on that. Uh, we have an open proceeding uh, and we need to tackle that in a serious way with as much input as possible. There's a related issue which goes to uh, a lot of some rural areas where there might be um, uh, no local provider that offers a particular kind of phone because the company that has the exclusive isn't there. And so another question we're looking at is, well, what about that? You know, if you live in a particular market where uh, a, a particular smartphone isn't available, does that make sense? And how does the innovation analysis work in that setting? So these are big, important, uh, lively issues at the FCC. And, and so it sounds like your, your answer is, well, we're collecting information and feedback mm -hmm. from consumers. If Kevin from Baltimore wants to, to make his viewpoint here known, he just goes to broadband.gov and he can, he can type it in, it sounds like. Yeah, you should go to broadband.gov or FCC.gov. One of the things that, you know, I'll tell you is that we, we inherited um, uh, a, a website that uh, won an award uh, in the 1980s, and that probably wasn't updated since. And okay. so we have a, just a terrific new media team, uh, kind of a SWAT team of really committed, really committed uh, folks who are working on upgrading our, our operations. They've done an incredible job. If you go to reboot.fcc.gov, it's actually a place where you can participate in our effort to recraft an FCC website that really works in an internet era. So, um, uh, so go there, uh, participate in our proceedings, let your views be known because we do listen. You know, our last video question comes from somebody who works in the telecommunications industry. We actually had several people from uh, various companies weighing in with some questions. This comes from uh, Paul, who works for Sprint in Kansas. Hi, I'm Paul Schieber, a vice president in Sprint's network organization based here in Overland Park, Kansas. Most people may not realize it, but the only part of a wireless phone call that's actually wireless is that part of the call that is from the user's mobile phone to the nearest cell tower. The balance of the call is carried over normal telephone lines that are typically provided by AT&T and Verizon. Our team here at Sprint is working hard to expand broadband wireless services and to keep rates low. But the rates that AT&T and Verizon charge us for access to their backhaul lines are outrageous because they have no competition. Those rates are a huge roadblock as we work to improve wireless broadband. As someone who's working to bring broadband to more Americans, 
and we appreciate the FCC's hard work on the National Broadband Plan. I'm interested to learn more about what the plan does to eliminate this roadblock to broadband expansion. Well, Paul is right. First, in his description that uh, when you make a mobile right. phone call, yeah. it goes uh, through our spectrum, it goes through wires, uh, and that uh, these issues, they have been raised with us about whether uh, some of the parts of the system that consumers don't really see are sufficiently competitive to promote competition. So when I talk about removing barriers, this is one of the issues that's identified in the National Broadband Plan. Is there sufficient competition uh, in these kind of intermediate uh, pieces of the infrastructure to make sure that competitors can fairly compete. There are a number of issues like this that the broadband plan identifies. There's sort of blood and guts issues that aren't particularly sexy, but uh, if we want to have a robust, high-speed, competitive broadband infrastructure, we have to take very seriously at the FCC. And you know, on this one too, there are there are uh, open proceedings that are looking at competition in this area. Our team here, just made up of some great people are collecting the information we need in this complicated landscape to be able to assess competition. Uh, we inherited, uh, in addition to an FCC with um, a kind of an old website, an FCC that didn't really have the data that it needed to have a strong point of view on the level of competition in different parts of the ecosystem and to justify actions to promote competition. Yeah. Well, by the, the sounds of the questions that came in, competition is definitely a key issue that I think a lot of, a lot of consumers are thinking about. So they'll, I'm sure they'll be keeping an eye on, on how that develops. Let's play one more round uh, to finish off our conversation, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, of FC Caesar. <laughs> so get those thumbs ready. Uh, the first uh, question of this round will come from Jay in Atlanta. At times, some members of Congress seem a little uninformed about new technologies. Are more tech-savvy people <laughs> needed in positions within the FCC to prevent our elected representatives from believing, for example, that the Internet is a series of tubes. Yeah, absolutely. We've been working very hard to bring more engineers, technologists, innovators, entrepreneurs from around the country into the FCC. It's a great question, and we need to do that around government. Great. The next one comes from Adam in Washington. Will there be subsidized broadband rates for students? Uh, well, you know, it, it, it depends. You know, there, there's a program that applies to low-income people who need help. This is our universal service fund to mm. afford broadband. Students may qualify for that, uh, but certainly we need to make sure that all of our students have real broadband access for the reasons we were talking about before. You can't uh, succeed in school without a high-speed broadband connection, and one way or the other, we need to make sure that all our students have that access. So a middle thumb sort of based on, depending on where well, you're at. Sort of thumbs speak. up on finding strategies that work for students in America to, high, to have high speed broadband at school and at home. And we have to be uh, prudent in how we do it, uh, um, uh, but we need, the goal is clear and we need to get there. Last one comes from, whoop, there we go, from uh, Central New York. Will the average consumer have access to a T1 speed internet connection by 2011, next year? Um, I'm not so sure. Y you know, we've set a goal of uh, affordable 100 megabits, much larger than T1, to 100 million households by 2020. Uh, will the average American have that access by 2011? Uh, I hope so. The faster, the better. Uh, but there are serious challenges around the country in rural areas and inner cities uh, um, uh, on broadband. It's why we're focused on the National Broadband Plan on tackling these issues. Great. Well, Mr. Chairman, before we let you go, let's let's end our conversation with a question from Ernie in rural Virginia. And I think it's a good one to sort of wrap up this conversation. What are you most excited about in this plan, and how would you like people to remember it decades from now? I think you know the, what I'm most excited about is the fact that after many many years, the United States has a plan for broadband. It has a plan for tackling this fundamental 21st century infrastructure issue for taking it seriously, for delivering on these critical goals around global competitiveness and innovation and jobs and opportunity and education and healthcare. So one, uh, I, I'm, I'm thrilled and excited about the fact that we have a plan, but uh, it's just the beginning. We have a lot of hard work to do now to deliver on the goals in the plan, the strategies and in, in the initiatives in the plan. We will need a lot of input from people who are watching this, from people who've asked the questions, uh, broadband.gov, we're just getting going uh, in, we've announced the plan today, now we've got to implement the plan. 
Great. Well, Mr. Chairman, thank you for taking time for us today, and you'll be able to see this interview on CitizenTube uh, in a few hours. Great. Thanks, Steve. Thanks. I appreciate it.